This is my experience, and it still scares me when I think back on that early morning. When I was a teenager, I was a bit of a nerd, a dork, so to speak. It was summer, and my family and I were heading off on a fishing trip. We were planning on going really far out into the mountains, fly fishing or mountain stream fishing, I can't remember. It was going to be a super boring trip for me because I was more interested in staying home at that age. I was against the whole trip from the get-go, but when I heard we had to leave for the trip at like 4am, I was super annoyed. I thought that we would sleep in the car, but that bright morning light at 4am, coupled with every bird in the entire world waking up and singing at exactly the same time prevented me from sleeping. We were driving around the mountains of Kingashima. The mountain roads were winding and car sicky. We were up high, and each time we rounded a bend, we seemed to be higher and higher. I only realized that the metal guardrail at the side closest to my window was separating us from the mountain's edge. The glistening blue sea was below at points. So it was early in the morning, and we had been driving for a while. There just seemed to be miles and miles and miles between each house. Just endless stretches of road. On one side there was a cliffside, and on the other, trees grew alongside the mountains. Then something up ahead came into view. I spotted an older woman stood right by the side of the road, close to the barrier. You know the guardrail. As we pulled up closer, I noticed it was an old lady. I could tell my parents were as shocked as I was, because there was a hushed silence in the car. They had been bickering about coffee, but when my dad turned the radio down instead of up, I knew that there was something going on. What was an old woman doing out here on the roadside this early in the morning? She didn't have any luggage or shopping, she was just sort of there by herself, hanging out. My dad pulled the car to a stop about 50 meters away from her. Another strange thing was the fact that it was early March, so the mornings were still cold. She wasn't dressed for that kind of weather. She was wearing clothing for a warmer temperature. My dad thought that she was in distress and in need of help. She did look cold. My mother, on the other hand, was quick to dismiss the idea of pulling over for the old lady. She said that the old lady freaked her out a bit. While this was happening, I found that I was unable to take my eyes off of the old lady. She seemed to notice me as we got closer, and I knew she was looking directly at me when we pulled to a stop. I was on my mother's side when I locked eyes with that old woman. I thought that she was danger. My mum even said, Hey, are we seeing some kind of spirit here? The three of us watched the old lady for a while from the safety of our car. It was a really weird morning. Suddenly, the old woman planted the palms of her hands against the guardrail and then she leant forward on her belly while keeping her balance. I wonder if I'm saying that right. I mean, it can't be easy to picture what I'm talking about here. I've managed to think up a way to explain it, though. Maybe this method was born of all the times I've had to tell this story. I don't know. Anyway, she looked like she was dangling herself over the edge. Kind of like the way you hang washing on a washing line. You know, you kind of just drape it over the line in the garden or on the clothes horse, and then the clothing hangs either side of it. It was like that. It's kind of weird, but think about how high we were up. She was dangling over the guardrail with nothing but the balance of her body from keeping herself from going over. Her feet were lifted off the ground. And why was she doing this? Was she putting on some kind of show for the first car that passed by? I know the exact place she did this strange act because I've been back there since. There is nothing but a huge drop. And then the tops of cedar trees below. She stopped her weird balancing act, and then turned to face our car. Once again, her eyes locked with mine. And she did this terrifying gesture, which will stay with me forever. She looked me in the eyes, and made a beckoning gesture towards the mountain ledge. She was smiling. My parents both began to really panic now. We all turned to whip off our seatbelts and get out of the car to stop what looked to be the inevitable. But as we braced ourselves to run over and stop her, we saw that she wasn't there anymore. It was as if she disappeared into thin air. To be honest, she could have dropped, and we wouldn't have seen her. I don't think I would have had the courage to look over that rail. It would have been traumatizing. We did not dare look over the side of that guardrail to check. My parents and I don't talk about that morning. That morning when everything felt real. 
I think, if I'm honest with myself, I know I saw that old lady. I know my parents saw that old lady. And I think I know what happened. And I don't think it was all that paranormal. Like I said, I think I know what happened. But I will never know why it happened. This happened when I was mountain climbing in the northern Alps of Japan. I had been climbing and hiking all day and I had gotten myself lost. Now, being lost on a mountain range is a special kind of fear, you know. When it begins to get dark, you feel something squirmy crawling around your stomach. But you know you just have to keep walking. Tiredness doesn't really matter as much. When fear is driving you, you cannot succumb to helplessness. When it got dark, I tried to follow the natural ridges of the mountain. I figured that they would lead me back to civilization. It's easier said than done, though, in the dark. I was looking in every direction for any form of light source, so I could aim myself towards it. I walked on with the idea in mind that when morning comes, I'll be thinking, Oh, well, that was intense being lost on the mountain, but I'm okay now. Thinking back on it, I must not have been in my right state of mind, because if I really wanted to get off that mountain range so desperately, I had an option to set up a bivouac. It was early autumn, and there was a chill in the night air. Before long, it would be freezing, and then there were the fierce winds. It whispered and whistled through the trees. The temperature was about zero. I decided to change tact. I gave up my mountain ridges pathway idea, and I decided to head down through the mountainous woods and undergrowth. I figured that it would be a little bit warmer that way. I was sliding, tripping, falling. It wasn't a smart idea. I just had to keep walking, though. Walking in the dark. I was terrified that I was going to come in contact with some kind of animal that could bite. I mean, the insects were just as bad. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I heard a voice calling from deep within the woods. It was calling my name. I felt a sudden rush of joy. I felt like someone had been searching for me. I felt more happy than scared. By right, I hadn't been missing long enough for anyone to be out here searching for me, though. Nevertheless, I followed the voice. I descended the mountain at a fast pace, searching for the owner of that voice. It was distant, but I could hear the direction it was coming from. The route I was taking was steep and hard, but I kept going. Eventually, I was running. More like that kind of run when you're coming down something steep, that unstoppable forward motion. I felt as if I was going to face plan at any moment, as if my foot would catch some outcropping rock and I would go flying. But thankfully, that didn't happen. Actually, kind of the opposite happened. My feet touched down on asphalt. I had somehow arrived on a mountain road. The road was better than tracing the mountain ridges. A road was better than the shelter of the forest. Hell, a road was even better than a call of an unknown voice. I remember feeling incredibly giddy, thinking to myself, I'm saved, I'm saved. I didn't have enough energy or natural light to keep going that night, so I decided to bivouac down for the night. I made my makeshift campsite by the side of the road. In the morning, I would check my location with my map and set about getting the hell out of there. That night, as I was trying to get some rest, I kept thinking of the voice I had heard. The words I heard were as follows, and I'll keep my name anonymous though. Right there. No, not yet, but close, come on. Ah, come on. Run! Go, go, go! Don't you give up now. You're so close. Come on, do your best, do your best! Something like that. I was told to run, but you know, I couldn't really because I was descending a mountain in the dark. So the voice that called to me didn't make a great deal of sense, but it saved me from a life and death situation. I'm sure of that. See, the thing is, when I heard the voice, I didn't even get creeped out by it. I mean, I should have, I guess, but I just wasn't scared of it. It all seemed fine. By the side of the road that night, I did wonder, I did wonder if I should have been a little more concerned, but that voice, feminine it was, it did nothing but warm my heart and raise my spirits. While I was mulling this over, I guess I fell asleep. I was exhausted. Well, that happened a few years ago. 
In the resulting years, a lot has changed, to be honest. I don't go on such ill-planned mountain climbs and hikes. <laughs> One very sad piece of news came a few years before that fateful hiking trip, though. My mum passed away. She was in her 50s. I thought that I would have a lot more years with her. After my mother's funeral, my dad handed me a box of videotapes. My mum had taped a lot of memories, and I was really glad. I watched one video one night when I really wanted to hear my mother's voice again. I popped in a tape, and one of my old basketball games appeared on the screen. It was way back when I was in junior high school. I remember that old jersey with a smile, the style of clothing, the audience, etc. It was all pretty nostalgic. My mother was there, screaming and cheering, the loudest of all the parents. <laughs> it was so great to hear her again. But then something clicked, like an internal click. The words of encouragement my mother had been shouting at me in that basketball game were the same words I had heard out on the mountain range alone. Right there. No, not yet, but close. Come on. Ah, come on. R run. Go, go, go. Don't you give up now. You're so close. Come on, do your best. Do your best. That support she gave me. It was eternal. I remembered what I was like at that age on the video. I went through a rebellious phase. I used to hate it and get embarrassed when my mum would cheer me on like that. I was so rude to her after those games. No matter how rude or mean I was to her after each game, she was still my number one supporter, my biggest fan. Even after leaving home, my mum would contact me often. She would ask me how I'm doing. She would just want to know everything I was up to. Did I ask her about herself enough? I don't know. When it sunk in that the voice I heard in the mountains sounded like my mum on that tape, the love I had for her overwhelmed me and I just couldn't stop crying. Since birth, she's always been taking care of me. So nowadays when I feel really down or work just gets overwhelming, I play that videotape and it gives me the strength to continue. It's like she's still being my number one fan. This happened a long time ago, one summer, but whenever I think back to it, it gives me the chills, even when it's hot out. When I was in elementary school, my family would often visit my grandparents' house in the summer. I used to love playing in the crop fields and the rice paddies. I loved looking for bugs and tadpoles at that age. One morning I had been running around like crazy in the hot sun and I was exhausted. I came back to my grandparents' place and ate lunch. I guess I was a little more tired than I realized. My parents said to me, why don't you take a nap? So I went upstairs to lay on the bed. I started to read a book, but I instantly fell asleep. I woke up a little later to find that I was home alone. I woke up and looked around the house and thought to myself, did you all go shopping? I looked out of the window and saw that the car was still there on the drive. Also my parents and grandparents' shoes were still there at the foot of the front door. Weird. And then I thought, I don't really care, and decided to get back to bug hunting. With that, I grabbed my bug net and my plastic little carry cage and I headed off. Pretty much as soon as I got outside, I started to get weird vibes. There was a certain creeping realization that something was wrong. The first thing I noticed was the fact that it was unusually quiet for the height of summer. Each morning I had awoken to the sound of countryside insects buzzing and chirping. But when I went outside, I couldn't hear a thing, not even a cicada. And it wasn't just the bugs that were absent. I couldn't hear anything, really. No birds, no cars, no voices. Whenever I passed through the neighborhood, I would at least hear some kind of noise, but that day I didn't hear a thing. I started to get freaked out. I looked into every house in the neighborhood, but I couldn't see or hear a single soul. I even went to a busy road. No cars passed by. No one was there. Before I knew it, the sun was beginning to set. The fear of being alone really crept up on me. I kept walking in search of any living person or creature, but I got nothing. I only went further away from Grandma and Grandpa's house. I ended up crouching by the side of the road, trembling. 
I realized that day that when humans are truly frightened, they can't cry. I was too frightened to cry. When the sun had completely set, I was left in the dark on an eerily still mountain road. But then I saw bright lights, the lights of a truck approaching. It was my grandpa's truck. When my eyes adjusted to the darkness of the truck's headlights, I saw that my parents were in the truck with my grandparents. The threads of anxiety which were tightening around my heart were suddenly cut, and I cried. Oh boy, how I cried. We all headed back to my grandparents' house. We spoke about what happened after I calmed down, and they said something which shocked me. They said that I said I would go upstairs to take a nap, but when they got upstairs to check on me later, they said they found my bed empty. Apparently everyone in the neighborhood was looking for me. Naturally, my parents were furious with me, and when I told them my account of what happened, no one believed me. Well, almost no one. My grandpa believed me. At first I thought he was just siding with me to show his sympathy, but I could tell he truly believed me when he said that something similar had happened to him as a young boy of about my age. There was a small stone jizol monument in my grandfather's village and he took me to that monument and asked me to thank it. I don't know what it means, but I did as he asked, since he was the only one who believed me. Maybe he knew something. Sadly, I can't ask him, as he died shortly after that summer. But it was a really weird and frightening experience for me. Hi everyone, it's me, Jay here. I just want to explain something if it isn't obvious, in the story, the writer mentioned a Jizo statue. You will now see one on the screen. A Jizo statue is usually a stone construction made in the image of the Jizo Bosatsu. And this is the guardian deity of children and travelers. They are said to have a spiritual power of protection in the Buddhist belief. I thought that would be interesting to share because it kind of ties the end of the story together there. If you hadn't heard of it, of course. Thanks. On to the next one. Oh, here's the bells. Long ago, back in the 20s, parts of a village were used as a garbage dump. What I mean by that is people would just dig holes and throw their trash in there. This would be the usual kind of household waste. This kind of dumping ground was called a hake. I'm not sure if it's the same in different regions, but that's the word I know it as. So let's go back to the future. One of my hobbies is to search for antiques and retro pieces. I guess it's kind of like metal detecting or mudlarking. Once I had learned about the hake, the 1920s dumping ground, I had to go see for myself if I could find anything. I was particularly interested in retro and vintage bottles and glassware. I would search for plots of land where villages and settlements used to stand. They are surprisingly common over here. Once I found an interesting place to explore, I would make contact with the current owner of the land or the town hall and ask for permission to come and search for the ancient relics. Some of these former village sites were very difficult to get to. I'm often driving down narrow, winding, one-way lanes. There's a lot of walking involved, too. On the day my experience took place, I had been struggling to find the site. It was the most remote former village that I had ever discovered. I had been walking and climbing for most of the day, and the sun was beginning to go down. I really didn't want to quit without finding the place, though. Before long, it got really dark out. It was darker than it seemed because the setting sun was hidden by the trees of the mountainous woods. I was heading into a dense and dark forest. Eventually, I found my location. I first saw some dilapidated houses. I was amazed to see that they were still standing in areas. I thought that the village was abandoned, so I had no worries about looking over the place. There was no sign of life there. I felt pretty safe despite the darkness. It was really interesting to walk through that abandoned and overgrown village. The crumbling buildings had been gripped by vines and weeds in their struggle for sunlight. 
I had to watch my step because the floor was littered with broken bricks and dead tree branches. I came to an area which I thought would be the hake. I searched without digging too much for any items which weren't potentially buried deep. I used a rake tool for this rather than a shovel. Before long I heard the satisfying clink of the rake against glass. I found a bottle. These vintage bottles can sell for a high price if you find the right buyer, so I had to be careful not to break it. However, what I found wasn't going to sell at all. I found an old pesticide bottle, and what was probably an old juice or milk bottle. There was nothing really worth taking home with me. Next I found some kind of glass, Coca-Cola looking bottle, and I think an eyedrop bottle. But then I found something that I knew would fetch a good price. It was some kind of beautiful pottery piece. I carefully dug it out, gently scraped away the dirt, and then took a look inside. What I saw inside that pot was something that made me drop it, look to the heavens, and decide to quit and leave that village. In the pot were several severed fingers, which had rotten with age. I could see mummy-like skin clinging to the ivory-white bones. They were just in there like it was some sort of collectible trinket or something. I made my mind up right then and there to get the hell out of there and never return. I was out late driving the other night. I was heading home. I think it was about midnight. To get back to my place, I have to go through some winding dark mountain roads. They're always kind of spooky in the middle of the night. But that night, something else terrified me. I rounded a bend in the road, and I had to slam on the brakes. There was a woman in the middle of the road, with her arms outstretched in a kind of stop gesture. She was blocking the road. I didn't like this situation, but I had no choice but to stop. When my car came to a standstill, she approached. She gestured for me to roll down the window. I obliged, and then she asked me for a ride. According to the woman's story, she had been left behind by a boyfriend of hers. They had an argument, and he told her to get out. Apparently, she didn't even have a chance to get her purse. She was saying she couldn't even call her parents to get her because... Her phone was in her boyfriend's car. I instantly felt sorry for her, but I also thought to myself, why do I have to give her a lift? Then another thought crept into my mind. What if this is fake? There's no guarantee that what she told me was even remotely true. It did kind of seem like a well-rehearsed story. Everything was covered, you know? No phone, no wallet, and the reason for her being out here alone. I had my suspicions that she wasn't out here alone, and her role was to stop my car. I felt like there could be people hiding by the sides of the roads, in the trees and bushes, waiting for their moment. Maybe I would be kidnapped or something, or maybe this was some kind of police sting. I've seen too many movies to know that whatever this was didn't seem legitimate. Something else was happening now. She was really escalating. She was close to tears and pleading for me to help, but her performance didn't seem genuine. It felt a little forced, a little studied and unnatural. No matter how I looked at the situation, I couldn't convince myself that it was a good idea to let this woman into my car or turn the engine off. I had to reply. I tried my best to turn her down politely. I felt like a real piece of shit, but something was sketchy about the situation. I felt it in my gut. She wanted my phone. I knew that that was the only thing I had which gave me communication to others. I needed it. But also, if I was to believe her story, she needed it right now just as much as I did. It was the only thing that would get her off of the road, too. If I didn't give her a ride, she didn't accept no for an answer. When she started looking around while she was yelling at me, I realized that it was time to go. I guess she could have been signaling to someone I couldn't see. There was no way I was going to give her my phone. 
I started recording everything. I would need the video and audio for my insurance company if anything was about to go down. I started honking my horn at her and slowly edging forward. She threw herself on my bonnet, but eventually let go. I pulled away slowly and looked back in my rear view mirror. I looked back to see her calmly sit down in the middle of the road. It looked like she was already waiting for the next driver to come along. That was another weird thing. If I was in her shoes, I would at least attempt at walking back towards a town, a city, a house, anything. I began to grow fearful for the next driver who would approach. I called the police and let them know about the situation and I headed home. The next day after work, I took the recording and put it on my computer as a backup in case I was ever asked for it. I spoke with my girlfriend about it and she hated my guts for not picking that woman up. She was so, so angry at me. I was accused of being inhuman and for being plain cruel. But I stand by my actions. It wasn't worth risking my life. The risk was too great. What's done is done. I was there, and no one else but that woman knows better than me about the situation. What a minefield of a situation it was. This happened when I went mountain climbing in the Kanto region. I love mountain climbing, I don't mind going by myself, in fact I enjoy it that way. I mean I didn't go up crazy high mountains alone often, I just did manageable ones. Mountains that wouldn't take more than 3 or 4 hours to climb. On the day in question I headed out early in the morning, it was a weekday, so there were barely any people out but me on the mountain trails. As I said, the mountain wasn't particularly high but it did have some very steep slopes, which were about halfway up the mountain. In these steep parts of the trail, jagged rocks jutted out of the mountain, making it a formidable climb. The left side of the trail is a mountain ridge, and the right side is a mountain cliff. Everywhere in between is covered in dense forest foliage. After about two hours or so, I reached the middle part, the part I mentioned with the steep slopes, and the jagged rocks. When I got to that part, I felt, I don't know, weird. I felt as if something was in the air, like a change in the atmosphere. I don't know, maybe that feeling when you know it's about to rain or storm? However, in my case, the air seemed to stand still. The leaves of the trees seemed to stop shaking and silence fell all around the mountain. I suddenly felt as if there were eyes on me, as if someone was watching. I scanned the dense forest and my eyes fell on a figure. It was a man. He was a few dozen meters ahead. He looked completely out of place. He didn't look like he was dressed to be mountain climbing at all. He was motionless and he just looked eerie. It was really strange and a frightening standoff. He just watched me. He was hardly wearing clothes. It looked like he had been out in the woods for a long time. I felt his cold gaze. It felt inhuman, yet so anciently human. After a few moments, he slipped into the forest and out of sight. That guy, even though he did nothing to me, he really freaked me out. I mean, it looked like he was living out here in the mountains. Like he was feral. I was halfway up the mountain. It wasn't as if I could stand still and wait for things to get less freaky for me. I had only one option, keep moving, so I kept climbing. I did see another climber on the mountain range, but he was dressed nothing like that other guy I saw. He didn't even look like he was the same build as the other guy. He just looked like a typical climber. He even had one of those metal canes climbers sometimes have. Basically what I'm trying to say is he looked completely different from that creepy guy I saw earlier. Because I was at the slope element of the hike, I could see ahead of me for a good ways. There was no one else around. Also, that meant that I couldn't see where that feral looking guy went. And just because I couldn't see him, it didn't mean that he wasn't around. Needless to say, I got the hell out of there as soon as I could, and I maneuvered myself as far away as possible from the point where I saw that weird guy in the woods on my way down. Now, I might take a weapon with me next time I go, 
that deep into the mountains because that incident really freaked me out. Do your best. 